The Ready to Learn Learning Triangle is a teaching tool. It addresses various learning styles and engages different senses. This workshop is based on these principles, view, read, and do. Today, this workshop is called, Who is My Child? Have any of you that has had children ever thought, who is this kid? Where did he come from? Anybody? Anybody ever think, who is this person I'm married to? <laughs> Where did he come from? Or why can I not get along with this one roommate? Any of you had that? This is um, this workshop. We're going to talk about different personality traits, um, different what we call temperament traits, and how you can use those to better the relationships in your life. And so as we discuss that, we're going to do some activities, we're going to have some group discussions, and we're really going to talk basically about personality and what makes us different and why. In many of the other workshops that we've discussed in the past and that you can view online, we've really talked about reading and the learning triangle and mostly about general um, ideas of how to use with your children. This one is a little bit different. In fact, it's different because I need your participation and I need your ideas. And one thing that we know about child development is that we, children develop what we call universally. We know that most children at a certain age are going to walk. Um, children at a certain age are going to talk. Children at a certain age are going to do the same things, no matter if they're born on one continent or another. And then what we have what we call contextual development. And that's because of their environment that they come from. And so they'll develop or they will actually experience things because of the cultural or ha their family um, dynamics. And the third one is the uniqueness. And we see this a lot, where a child is very unique in the way they develop. In most of the other workshops that we've talked about, we talk more about that universal. We talk about stages that children should be in at a specific age. This particular workshop, Who is My Child, is really focused more on the uniqueness and also the environment. And we're going to talk about how children are very different and how we can help them in each of the stages. The first thing we're going to do is define temperament because that is what we're talking about, is a child's temperament. Now I want you to just think about what have your thoughts been? What is temperament? What do you think temperament is? Um, Robert, what do you think temperament is? Have you even heard of that word before? Yes. When I think of temperament, I think of somebody's mood or disposition. Okay. Okay. Anybody think of somebody that's temperamental <laughs> that might be a little hard to get along with? That's usually what we think about when we think about temperament and temperamental. But Robert was right. It's about their mood and how they act. The first thing we're going to do is do a little activity to help you think about who you are. We're talking about who is your child. We want to know who you are. And so what we'd like you to do is in front of you, um, you have just a little cup of candies. And I want you to close your eyes, if you can, and just take two of them out because we want you to get two colors. And what we would like you to do is um, uh, to the person next to you, behind you, somebody that maybe you don't know, you can open your eyes once you've found those two colors. If you've got the same color, you might want to put it back and get a different color. What we're going to do is uh, we have a little chart. <clears throat> and if you have the color red, I want you to share with the person next to you or behind you one way you are different now than you were as a child. If you have yellow, we want to share, have you share something about yourself that you would like to change. Just one thing, okay? If you have green, share something about yourself that has helped you succeed in life. If you have orange, share something about each of your children that you enjoy. Now, there's some of you in this room that have quite a few children, and some of you don't have any children. <laughs> if you have an orange, you could talk about, if you have children, just talk about one of them. If you have pink, which I don't think anyone has pink, so let's go with purple. Thank you. If you have purple, share a special memory you have as a parent 
or if you are a spouse or something about um, working with children. And um, if you have a white, now if we haven't named any other color that you have, you get to be white. It's the wild card. Share something you enjoy about being a parent. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I want you to do is you each got to take two. So you get to take your favorite color out of those choices. So just start thinking about that and just start discussing. You can do it as a table. You can do it with the person next to you. Um, and if you're watching this as, a, as the webinar, maybe d um, think about this. Use it as a group activity. Do it at dinner tonight and see what some of the answers that you come up with. Okay? So we'll just have you guys discuss. <laughs> As you were discussing your candy game, did you find something about yourself that maybe you forgot? Or have you found yourself to be relatively the same all of your life? Who had red? Is there anyone that had red that um, share one way you're different now than you were as a child? Okay, Mary, what was something that you are different? As a child, I was painfully shy. I could not speak to people, even kids my own age, I couldn't speak to them. And as an adult, I've learned to get over that a little bit and to be able to reach out a little bit more. It's still hard for me. Okay. I still struggle, but I can do it now. Okay, thank you. Um, yellow, share something about yourself you'd like to change. Does anyone have yellow that would like to share that? I have yellow. Okay. I'm not sure you want me to oh, okay. <laughs> I've had four babies. I have things I need to change. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Have, have any of you thought, um, as you've gone on in your life, I'm going to change this, I'm going to change this, I'm going to change this, and it's still the same goals that you've been working on? Yes. Uh, maybe patience? Yeah. You know, you think, oh, next year I'm going to be more patient. Next year I'm going to do this. Next year I'm going to be more outgoing. Isn't it interesting that the things that we want to change about ourselves usually are pretty consistent. Green, this is one of my favorite um, ones. Share something about yourself that has helped you succeed. Who has had who had green that would like to share? Okay, Shelly. Um, basically, I think uh, from the time we're very young, our education okay. is the one thing that, uh, that I know that has helped me succeed to where I am today. Okay. Is there anyone that thought of a person that helped them succeed? Oh. Barbara. Well, I think my parents helped me succeed. Okay. But I was going to say, in my temperament, I was very, very persistent, and I think it helped. It helped me succeed. So maybe a trait? Yeah. A trait helped mm -hmm. me succeed? Okay. Um, Robert, you had your hand up there. Yeah, I was just thinking that when I picked up my green colored candy, that there, it was really just a lot of people in my life that have opened doors up for some reason, just the relationships that I've had and, and getting to know people. It's really opened up the majority of the doors that I would consider to be successful in my life. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we're going to skip the orange and pink because we could all ha we all have a special <laughs> memory. Um, when I was actually teaching this workshop um, to a group of young mothers, we came to the to the pink one. Share a special memory you have as a parent or caregiver, and it took a while for those young moms to actually be able to verbalize how they felt, what was special. And sometimes we all feel like that. We know how we feel, but sometimes it's hard that um, hard to sometimes say how we feel. Um, we're going to go ahead now in this next segment and actually define what temperament is and, and how you use it and what makes up temperament. And so uh, as you look through your handout, we're going to go to page two. And we're going to actually make some decisions on what is practical or practical guide to temperament. How many of you have actually heard of the word temperament just by a show of hands? Okay. What are some of the words that come to mind, Tom, when you think of temperament? Moody. Okay. So uh, an actual mood. Yeah. But that's not a good mood, right? Um, not always. No. Not always a good mood. Okay. <laughs> most and of the time not. Most of the time not. Anyone else heard of temperament and have a different idea? I 
I think of their overall personality. Okay, Mary has the right answer. M overall personality is a really good word to, um, an another word for temperament is personality. So let's define what a personality is. First of all, on um, our page two, you, we have some um, questionnaires that you can answer as we go through this. Um, temperament, um, what it is, is usually how a person acts, okay? It's not what makes them act like that, but it's how they act, how they, what they do in certain situations. And do all of us act the same way in a certain situation? No, we don't. And so it's why we act that way or how we act. And it's made up of several different traits. Now the best way to de for me to define this to you about the traits is look around the room, okay? Pam, how many hair colors are there? Maybe not in this room, but in general. How many? Oh, in general. Yeah. <laughs> Ten. Ten? It depends on if there's a bottle involved. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so let's name a few natural colors. Blonde. Blonde. Brown. Brown. Or brunette, I okay. guess. Um, redhead. Black. Okay. Um, Gray. Gray. <laughs> Bald. <laughs> there really isn't a lot of different no, hair colors. Five. But as we look around the room and around the world, boy, we don't all share the same exact hair color. What about eye color? Brett, how many eye colors are there? Can you think, just start naming the ones Blue, that you... brown, green, hazel, four or five, I'd say. Okay, and hazel is usually a mixture, isn't it? Okay, there's not very many. And when we talk about temperament traits, there's only nine. There's only nine temperament traits. But just like our physical traits that make us all look very different, yet there's very few of them, that's what you want to think about as temperament traits. Even though there's nine, the way we combine them is going to make us each very, very unique. And then the next one is probably, if you could circle this one, it's the one thing that I have to remind myself of as with my relationships. It's neither good nor bad, okay? Temperament is, not, is neither good nor bad. There's not any judgment call on temperament. It's how we act. And then the last one, it has nothing to do with temper. You know, even though it has that word temper in it, it has nothing to do with temper. And so what we're going to do, and one thing that I want you to end up with and realizing that temperament is yours or your child's basic self. It's who you basically are. Now, Mary made a very interesting comment that I want to go back to. And research has shown that our temperament starts at about, we don't really want to judge a person's temperament or really look at it until they're past three, okay? But as we get to about three, we will see definite personality traits. And you might even say, oh wow, I had a six month old and his was right from the start, or hers were right from the start. But like Mary said, is she was shy as a child and she said, but I try now. Now Mary's um, basic self goes back to that shyness. Mary has to work at not being shy, am I correct in that? And when we think about our personality traits, there's some that we do change. But when we go back to our, really our basic self, it's who we were when we were just even a little child. Now one thing that I want to bring up or re-emphasize here is that when we look at child, children's development and child development, is we look at it in three different areas. We look at it in the universal. And the universal is where everyone develops during that stage, such as walking and talking and eating and those kind of things, where we know universally, no matter where you live in the world, that's going to happen. The other two really go into this temperament traits, and that is our context. Who raised you? What part of the world did you get raised in? What was your religion? What was your school? Who were your friends? Those have a bearing on our temperament or our personality. And the third one is the one that I think is the hardest for sometimes as parents to understand, and that's the unique tendencies that children have. That no matter where they're born, 
no matter who their parent is. They just have a unique personality that's all their own. And so as, you, as we talk about temperament, remember that we're looking in those two different domains, the context and the uniqueness of each child or the uniqueness of each person. We are going to now talk about the different temperament traits and how you can start looking at what temperament do I have? What temperament does my child have? And why does it really matter? Why would you even know, need to know about temperament? In fact, how many of you have ever had a class about temperament before? It's very interesting that temperament, just one out of the whole group, as, it's interesting that temperament was actually, the research done on it started in 1950. And what is very interesting is right now there's just a surge in trying to understand um, temperament and what it is. Because the one thing that we do know is a lot of it is going to be our environment and some of it's going to be our genetics. And so we're trying to figure out how much does a genetic play? How hardwired are we? And there are, has been some research that indicates that there is a gene in your body that if you have, if you're always wanting to do something new and a new thrill, they call it the novelty gene, actually. And they're saying that that gene is a little bit longer than most people's, and that causes you to be more active. Now, there's a lot of critics on this study, by the way, so you need to look at both sides. But they also have talked about, because that is a longer actual gene and it has a longer axon, and remember when we <coughs> talked in cognitive development about axon, it's what transmits our thoughts and our feelings and our actions to make a, a, any kind of action. And they have found in that novelty gene that it's a little bit longer. And so those people that have that gene actually respond quicker. They're probably the ones that answer questions a little bit faster. Where the rest of us who might not have that gene, we need to have a little bit more time for that synapsis to happen. And so why do we need to know about temperament? Why is it important? Candace, is there anything that you can think of? Why would you need to understand your child's personality? How to respond to them in any given situation. Okay. Anything else? Nancy? I think it's important to understand so that you can kind of help guide them as they grow up into maybe a career path that's more suitable for their particular personality. Okay. Do you have a particular example that you were thinking of in that? Well, just the fact that, I mean, for instance, like sales. Some people are born salesmen and other people couldn't sell something if they had to. Okay, that's so. right. You know, and that's is very um, <coughs> interesting because our first one is you can provide activities that work with your child's temperament and things that he can enjoy. And as we get older, we want those activities to continue. You can encourage children for her activities which um, best fit. Now, the one thing that I want to temper here is we also need to sometimes encourage a child that maybe their temperament or their personality doesn't want to maybe do certain things, give them some activities to experience that or help them have an understanding. And then the last thing is you can understand how you and your child or your spouse or your mother-in-law or your whatever roommate, how you're alike and different. Um, I have to say, when I first was able to be trained in this and when I went to college, it was a real eye-opener that maybe I shouldn't be trying to change some of the people in my life. Maybe I need to be accepted their personality and learn from that and have that help me. And so as you look it through here, um, why should we know? Because it will really help what we call make a better fit for children. discuss the nine different temperament traits. And one thing that I want you to understand is everyone has all nine of these traits, but we have them in different levels. And so as we discuss these nine different temperament traits, I want you to start thinking, where do I fit? Where 
do, where's my level? And the one thing that research has found is that there's usually four temperament traits that you exhibit either a very high level or a very low level. And that's who really defines your personality. If you have a very high level in that or a very low level, that really makes you that trait stand out. Now, as you look at those nine different temperament traits, there's activity levels, sensitivity to senses, awareness of feelings, strength of expression, persistence. Barbara talked about being persistent as a child and is still persistent as an adult. Um, distractibility, ability to change, need for a physical routine and usual mood. We are going to go through each one of these and talk about what they are and maybe some of the characteristics that you can see in those. Now remember, all of us have all nine of these temperament traits. So do the children in your life, okay? And so we do not want to ever label a child that, oh, they're only persistence, because that's not true. They have all of those other traits. It just depends on what level they have it on. And so as we go through each one of these traits, we're going to have some words that will help you start looking at people and help you start defining them. Now, on the table in front of you, you actually will have three different colored pencils. And what we want you to do is as we start talking about each temperament trait, we want you to circle, um, think of yourself. Okay? I want you to think of yourself. And if this, those words describe you, then use one color and circle those words. And now, here's the hard part. I want you to think about a person in your life. It doesn't have to be a child. And if you are thinking about a child, remember it needs to be someone that's older than three. Because we don't want to really classify a child younger than three yet. And so if it is a child, or maybe it's a spouse, Maybe it's a roommate that you're not getting along with. It can be anyone, but we want you to take another pencil and start circling the words that describe him. And so next we're going to go into each of the temperament traits, and this is where it gets fun because we're gonna start saying, wow, I really like that, or wow, that person's really like that. As we talk about words, I got a little ahead of myself in the last segment, is the words that you're going to circle start on page seven. And we take each temperament trait, and we have some words and some examples about each temperament trait, and this will help you really start to understand. Now the first temperament trait that we're going to talk about is really something that we all pretty well understand, activity level. Now, as you look at the monitor here, I'm asking you to do different things, but I want you to look at the monitor. And I want you to look, and Saul, where would you be at that park as a child? Um, Which the, person would you be? In the swing. In the swing? I will totally be in the swing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Would you be jumping out? Or, oh, yeah. you know, want to jump out, try to get as high as you could and then jump out? Oh, certainly. Okay. Brett, yes. where would you be? I guess I'd be with him. Okay. <laughs> would you be shoving him off so you could get on? <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but I'd definitely be in the swing. Uh, going as high as you could? Yep. Would you might have stitches afterwards? More than likely. More than likely? Okay. Um, Tom, where would you be? I would probably be on that duck. The duck? Okay. Would you be watching other people? Oh, no. I would be totally into it. Okay, okay. Why? I'm just, just curious. Those are really fun to ride those things back and okay, forth. And I'd be trying to see if I could touch the ground on each side. So. Okay. Well, is there anybody here that might be this person that's just oblivious to their game? <laughs> Nancy? Would, be me. would you be reading a book yes. or daydreaming? Reading a book. Okay. Rachel raised her hand very yeah. quickly. <laughs> reading the book. I would be reading a book. Okay. I'm just completely oblivious to okay. everything going on around me. Is there anybody that would be this child like, I hate this. Why did I have to come here? <laughs> okay. Um, this is a really fun description. I have to say I would be on the swing going as high as I could, but I'd never jump. I would never do anything to hurt myself. <laughs> so, But I would be waiting for my turn on the swing. Um, and so as you look at that, it's interesting to see our activity levels. Now on our traits or on your activity guide, 
on page seven, here's some words. Now, if you're circling maybe both sets, that means that you're probably neutral. It depends on your environment, okay? But if you're only circling the words like lively and restless and hyper and a handful, then you know what? This might be a trait that is high. Now, once again, if you're only circling the words like slow, quiet, idle, and calm, you would have a very low level, okay? So can you see how one, you can have activity level, but you might have a high activity level and a low activity level. Now, I'm asking you to do several things at once. So if you've, if you've been able to color code for the ones for you and then go back and color code the ones for a certain person that you're thinking of, it can be anyone you want. If you have older children, try to do this with each one of them. It was interesting when I did it, I started first with my husband and then went with each child. And it was very, you know, a lot of it was like some, some of them right away, I didn't have any questions, but others it was like, oh, huh, that really helps me. Okay, now we're going to turn to the second one and go to sensitivity of senses. Um, a lot of times this is something that um, people don't quite understand until we start talking about it and then you go, oh yeah. Sensitivity to senses is where a child or an adult is sensitive to our senses. So Robert, what are some of our senses? Are you talking about our five senses? Yes, like I am. Sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch? Okay, perfect. All of those. Okay, anyone in this room, loud noises bother? You cannot stand it being too noisy? Only one? Only one. What about smells? Is there anyone in here that smells are really not, is, if you have a certain smell, it's going to drive you crazy? No? Okay, this is one that's really, um, really common right now. It's interesting that we understand it. How many do not like to have people touching them? <laughs> Did, give your, okay, give me my space. Or do you, any of you have a child that if it tags, bothering them, they have to cut it out. It's interesting that you start thinking of this. And um, I have to say that I have a child that their, one of their sensitivities is to smell. And you know, I didn't really understand it until I became pregnant. And then I, you know, I mean, I was pregnant with him, but as I was pregnant, it was the only time that I could understand how he was feeling. And um, when we talk about um, helping children with activities, I remember when he was in preschool that I very specifically told his preschool teacher that he did not like smells. And anything that was abnormal really it was a gag reflex. And so one day, this preschool teacher took them to the, um, they were making bread. Now the bread was not baking, it was rising. And so what smell is that? Yeast. Yeast. This little boy threw up during the production. They had to close that production line down. <laughs> the preschool teacher came back to me and said, she was very angry, and I said to her, I told you, smells really bother him. Now, and I think as an adult, that has continued in his life where smells are something that he's very sensitive with. And for me, it's noise. I do not like, just like Mary, do not like a lot of noise. In fact, I was teaching this particular class and at the time the air conditioner was broken and so they had brought in two different fans. And just the noise and I got, we got going and I just could not keep on track. And finally I just stopped and I said, is that noise bothering anyone? And there was only like two other people. And I'm like, what? I can't, I cannot even think straight because of that noise. And as we started talking, another lady said, I just hate when the lights are on at night. I can't stand it when my husband leaves the lights on. I need it completely dark. And so when you start thinking about that, I want you to think of your children. And I want to just give you one more example. Um, I'm working with some child care providers, they had a little boy that during nap time could not fall asleep. 
because it's a state law that you cannot have all the lights off, okay? Pretty um, self-explanatory. Well, this little boy could not fall asleep. And so the daycare provider and the mother worked with each other is they actually made him a little mask. It was a superhero mask. So he felt pretty cool. And he actually was able to put that on and fall asleep in that because the sight or the light was very distracting. And so really, can you see how the mom made his um, environment a good fit? So let's look at the words. Sensitive, unaware, okay? Nervous, cuddly, artistic, hmm. Touchy-feely, clingy, overactive. I want you to maybe even start thinking of when we think of those sensitivities, and we, most of these are done with um, the sensitivity to touch, but there's a lot of other the senses. Um, anybody have a child that um, texture when they eat? They won't eat certain foods. Okay, Shelly, yeah. do you want to tell us what it is? Or? <laughs> well, as, as a child, I could not eat oranges because of that membrane that's in there, and I think because I had really bad tonsils and they were so large that I just could never okay. do that. But my, my daughter was, I'm trying to think what she was eating the other day, and she says, I just can't eat that because it has a funny texture. Okay. So. so even we have a grandson that, I'm not kidding, if it has any weird texture, it's, <laughs> you can't, he will not eat it, it's, it gags him. And so when we start thinking of that, that that starts to define your personality. And they're not just picky eaters all the time. It's who they really are. I love this picture. And how many have ever had this experience where they've taken their child to something they may have saved for months to take him to a special <laughs> event, and it was way out of their comfort zone? Okay, because of the sensitivity to senses. The next one, I have to say, is one of my favorites, if there is a favorite of temperament traits. Awareness of people's feelings. Let's look at this slide. Hmm, we've got a little girl that lost her ice cream. And this little girl, I'm not even going to eat mine. I'm going to give it to you. And you have this child that's completely unaware of what's going on. Now, I have to say, remember, let's go back to the beginning, defining temperament, that temperament is neither good nor bad. I have to say, I used to think this kid was bad, okay? <laughs> Any of you? Because this is probably one of my highest traits, is awareness of other people's feelings. And I happen to be married to a really wonderful guy, but it is one of his lowest, he, it, you know, not lowest traits, he has a very low awareness of other people's feelings. And it's been very interesting in our relationship that as we've gone on, that um, sometimes I'll say something and he'll just say, huh, I didn't notice that, or I wasn't aware of that. And I'm just gonna share one particular experience is we were um, talking to a very, very good friend, not a casual acquaintance, but a very good friend. And this friend was telling us he had lost his job. And what was he going to do? And, you know, he was really, I mean, he has a family to support. And, you know, here he was going, and we were trying to brainstorm about different opportunities. And as we turned to leave, my husband looked at him and said, have a good day. And I walk out, and we get in the car, and I am like, have a good day? He just lost his job. Have a good day? And he's like, ooh, that probably wasn't the right thing to say. Now, good or bad, where could my, this trait be difficult for me? Where could it be, you know, something that's not a good idea? Any ideas? Saul? Well, it, it would be when you uh, lose attention about yourself. Okay. Uh, you're, you're so much thinking about other people's feelings that you forget about yourself and, you know, feeling that glass for self-confidence, I will say. Okay, and that's really good. Is there anyone that has a child that has automatically come with this, or this is his personality trait, that he's very aware of other people's feelings? Okay, so Candace, and what is something that you need to almost protect that child sometimes, don't you? Why? Yeah. Um, I think because, like this gentleman said, uh, she wouldn't take care of herself first. She would always be willing to give and do for other people and, and maybe to the point of being uh, used. Okay. Um, 
And so can you see where temperament is neither good nor bad? And this really helped me. In fact, there's been so many times, many more times that um, this has helped me with my husband is he's been able to say to me, you need to step back, Stephanie. That is not your problem. Your kids are old enough, or that's their relationship, or you don't have to worry about the comment that was made in the driveway at the supermarket that they said, you know, you do not have to, because that really has, he's helped me bring that back into really good perspective. And just so you know that when you have a child that is like this, sometimes you have to take a step back and say, um, Sally, you don't always have to give up your ice cream cone. It's not always, you know, maybe sharing would be a better idea. Okay, so as you circle those words, kind, uncaring, tough, sweet, sensitive, selfish, thoughtful, and precise. Remember to circle one color for you and one color for another person. Um, now, what, I want you to know that on this um, handout that you have, I'm describing some of the things, but it actually has some of those comments on here. A child who is aware of feelings may be very caring and sympathetic. We're just vocalizing those. And so as you can read through those at home, or um, you might read through them as we're talking, but we're trying to just generalize them in here. The next one, strength of expression. I remember when a dear friend of mine came to this workshop for a very first time, and she's like, it was like a light bulb went on for her. It's like, oh, that's it. I didn't realize that. This is a temperament trait. <laughs> Once again, it's neither good nor bad. Um, how many have um, a child that you wouldn't just give a penny for their thoughts, you would give a million dollars, you know? <laughs> I have a boy that, I mean, you talk to him and you'll say, well, what's going on? Or what are you thinking? You know, and you just don't know. And you're just, it's just like, so you call other people. <laughs> well, have one of you heard, you know, isn't that interesting? Any of you married to a person like this? Any of you that, um, <laughs> okay, it is really. Now, some of you might be married to the person that you know exactly how they're feeling when they walk in the door. Any of you work with a person like this that you really know exactly and sometimes it's a little too much information that is their personality and so their strength of expression now when we talk strength of expressions it's like an open book okay so you know exactly what they're thinking and then that person that you wish you could just have a clue about um, and so words for this dramatic overactive calm passive bossy <laughs> persuasive gentle and meek any of you finding um, word, um, traits that you're circling all the words? Is it surprising <laughs> any of you? Remember, if you circle, uh, you know, just uh, most of them, it probably means you're neutral. But if you're only circling one set of words, then that will mean you're high or low. Or if you're not circling any of them, once again, that means you're um, probably neutral in that. But you have some of it. You have some of that trait. The next one is persistence. Um, you know, I, I look at this. Any of you willing to say that you're a persistence person, that once you decide you're going to do something, you stick to it, and you are not going to let that project go until it's done and done right? Is there anyone? OK. Rachel? OK. Has it helped you in your life? It has. Most of the time, you know, I get things done, but it also means that I'm not flexible at all. And if things change or if a problem comes up and I can't finish it, it gets very frustrating. Okay. And so once again, it's neither good nor bad. But sometimes when we have a certain trait, sometimes we look at the negative. And remember the very first when we took the candies and something that has helped you succeed. Most of your personality traits has done something to help you succeed. And one thing is I want you to reflect on your traits because we're getting closer to the end. And look at how has that helped me? And how can maybe I change a little bit, OK? So in persistence, a child that or a person that's persistent sometimes will be called stubborn, determined, or if they have less of this, flexible, stick to it, unchangeable, doesn't give up, willful, helpful. 
Tenacious is another good word because most people don't understand it. So you can be saying, oh, they're so tenacious and they don't know what you're saying. <laughs> but that means mm -hmm. stubborn. And um, we don't have a lot of words for the child that is less persistent. Tell me some of the words that you would think of if you have a child that's less per, um, persistent. Because I have a couple that, you know, uh, I'm not going to do that. Nah, it's too hard. Sometimes we consider them lazy in a way where they're not. Yes. Give up too easily. Give up too easily. Okay, sometimes we think of that in a negative turn instead of maybe they can just move on and, and not have to always focus. Um, one time I was talking to a lady just uh, that has this trait like Rachel was saying, and she said, you know, I really guess I've always looked at this trait more as a negative because I always watched people that could just sort of stop and smell the roses or not get so consumed with one project. And she says, now I can see that it has helped me, but then I can change if I want to, that, there, you know, that I can do that. And to look at the good in both of them. Okay, the next one almost seems like um, they're, they're very opposite, distractibility. Now, um, we are not, as we're talking about these temperament traits, one thing that I want you to be very clear on is we are not talking about um, children or adults that have an excessive of this trait. Sometimes if a child was active, even though we said the word hyper, we do not want to classify them as hyperactive unless they've been clinically diagnosed with that. And there are children that because of their brain chemistry have a trait or a personality, um, some children because of the sensitivity of the senses, it overshadows all over nine ones, all over the nine ones, saying that correctly. Um, and so when you get to a point where one trait exhibits more than any other trait, you might start thinking, does my child have maybe not a disorder, but is there something we can do to help them? And when we talked about distractibility, we're not talking about ADD. Okay, although sometimes we want to just almost classify children with that because they have those temperament traits. And so in distractibility, some of the ones that it's almost like persistence. But I want to ask you, do you know a person that's very persistent, maybe in their way, but can still be distracted? I have a son, um, one of my sons, I have um, three boys and one daughter and one of my um, actually my daughter and my um, oldest son are very persistent when they get an idea you are not going to change their mind but they're also distracted as they will um, if with certain activities lose focus very easy but when they want something but they so they can be both and that's one thing that I want you to understand is they can be both so as you look at that okay we're going to turn to the next one Ability to accept change. Um, I have a story about my mother, and since she's not here, I can tell about it. Is my mom really has a hard time with change, really has a hard time with change. And when I lived um, far away from her, coming to visit me was very difficult for, for her. After about two or three days, she was ready to go home. You know, she spent two or three days getting there, and now she's ready to go home because she did, doesn't like the change. And so, um, and when you look at people like this, um, they, a person that doesn't like change, they're very cautious. They need to take some time. And um, with children, sometimes we say to them, oh, you're going to be all right. Just go into that class or go do this. You're going to be fine. Now, if your child has a hard time accepting change, you might want to find the time or um, help them just gradually move into that. And so friendly, adaptable, cautious, shy, outgoing, adventurous, inflexible, and fearful. Now, I have a granddaughter, and she has a very low level of ability to change. She can just go with the flow. Okay, now does she miss her mom and dad when they leave? Yeah, she does. But she is very adaptable and she moves, uh, her parents, um, they move a lot and, and they have a job where they're gone a lot. And so she's been very, maybe it's been her environment that's caused that. But wherever she goes, she can move very easily. 
But I have a nephew that's very cautious and has to really warm up to new things. Neither good nor bad. It will help them both in both areas. Okay, the next one is a little bit similar. Now, when we're talking about children, a need for a physical routine is very important with a child. Um, if life is very chaotic, it really affects all areas of development. Now, chaotic is very different than having to sleep at the same time. So when you think of that, remember that children, for the most part, do need a physical um, routine. But as we get older, we find people that, oh my goodness, it's 9 o'clock, I've got to go home, and those type of things. Now, once again, I, my mother fits into this, and she happened to um, come over to my house one Sunday evening just for a visit, and they weren't there for more than a half an hour, and my mom said to my dad, we got to go, we got to go. And I finally said, why? She said, I left dishes in the sink. And I just was like, wow, okay. But she needed her routine is when you eat, you do the dishes. Then you go on to other things. And her routine is very important for her. And it served her very well. It's been a really good thing. Now, my last child was born when my oldest was 18. And um, I had um, two boys in high school and another one in elementary school. And so her uh, routine was let's which basketball game are we going to and so she actually didn't have as much routine as my oldest child just because of the environment of our life and she still is very flexible in that too and so was it her environment or was it her genetics we might not know but she's been able to although she does like to go home and she after she's been gone for a while she likes her own space too so um at, circle those words um I'm going to just stop here before we get to usual moods. Has anybody been surprised at any of the colors that are exhibiting in your temperament traits? Rachel, you're the only one shaking your head. For yourself or for the person you're circling? Um, a little bit of both. And it's interesting to see how we, re you know, how we interact now that I'm seeing the colors with the different personality traits with the two of us. Okay. Okay, anybody else dare to comment? Because that's a little tricky question. Uh, well, for William? Me, I noticed that with the person I'm comparing myself with, that I'm looking at how we interact with each other, and I think that we are so different, but yet I'm finding many similarities in this, <laughs> surprisingly. Yeah, sometimes the person we might not be getting along with, we are so much alike that we didn't realize it. Isn't that interesting? In some things and then other areas, we might be very, very different. Okay, this last trait is one that a lot of people don't quite understand, and so I'm going to give you some examples. Usual mood. Now, all of us, you know, we have a mood, but there are some people that you just know. The minute you walk in, they're happy. How many of you know a person like that, that can think of a person like that? When we talk about usual mood, there's three usual moods that will really define a person's personality. And the first one is usually happy. And the second one is serious, and the third one is less positive. They've put a really good positive spin on less positive there. But the first one, I have to say, there's a person that I've known um, in, for, for, for several years. And we worked together, and we grew up in the same town. And, and just in the last year, she has lost her job. And she's always happy, always happy. Well, I remember the very first time I went to visit her after she lost her job, and she was not happy. And it was hard for me to understand. I'm like, you're always happy. What? You know, I didn't say that. But I, in my mind, it was really hard for me to accept that she was really going through a difficult time, not to accept that it was a difficult time, but she usually was the kind of person is, oh, everything will be okay. And so her, her personality trait was really, that defined her. It was probably the most defining thing about her. And so it was hard for me to know how to act with her because she was not happy and there was a reason why. Now, a person that's always serious, 
Does anyone know a person that's always serious? Okay. My husband. Okay. I'll crack a joke and he'll tell me, I laughed on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> that does not help somebody who's like an extrovert, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and Diana is prob would, not probably, she would fit into the category of usually happy. If any of you know Diana, she's usually happy. And um, after meeting Diana and then meeting her husband, it was, it was, you know, opposite to track. And uh, he, but he's very kind and very thoughtful, but very serious, very, very serious. Okay. And so um, as you think of that, um, start circling some of the wor words. The last one is a child who is less positive or a person that's less positive. How many know a person that's less positive? Okay. Most of us do. How is this a good thing? How is it a good thing? It's neither good nor bad. It's neither good nor it's bad. Neutral. Thank you, Diana. How can it have a positive for a child that's less positive? Usually that child, that's a very good question, Brett, and usually that child is a child that has a hard time with change, too. And one person that I'm thinking of in particular um, is our grandson, and we love him like we love our own grandchildren, but he really ha is less positive, and so we have to make special effort to get him to be excited about things, and anytime he tries something new, I remember the first time we took him sledding, sledding, the first time we took him sledding, um, I think people around us thought we were hurting him or hitting him because <laughs> he was screaming. And so one thing with that, Brett, is you have to understand with a child that is like that, you're going to have to give him lots of opportunities to see the good, but you also have to be very open to how he's feeling and make sure that you don't always say, oh, just snap out of it, or, but really try to understand. I have to say, I think out of all the personality traits for a child, this is one of the hardest ones for us to understand. And sometimes the environment is going to create an unhappy child, and sometimes it's just the way they are. We've gone through all nine different temperament traits very quickly. Okay, so um, make a score of your temperament traits. Uh, score them. Somebody's saying, what do you mean make a score? See what ones that you circled. Now, generally speaking, <laughs> you will have four that's either high or low. Is that the case? No? Please say someone. Yes. Okay. Barbara? Yes. Okay. So <laughs> do, you, do, you mind, yeah. <laughs> do you mind sharing which ones of the, of the four of you? And did it surprise you? Um, yeah, it did surprise me because uh, looking at some of the, like, sensitivity to senses, I was thinking about my second daughter. And I can see where she's really strong in some areas. And I mean, she's really strong in some temperament areas. Like, she is very sensitive. But on the other hand, she's also very active. So it's okay. kind of interesting, the mixture. OK, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Anybody surprised at their own findings? I just want to know, usually, Saul, why? Well, it was interesting for me because I was looking at uh, persistence as well as the uh, ability to accept change. And I was um, thinking of. I believe my, my personality, my core genetic personality, is more of persistence. But um, I grew up uh, living in different countries. I actually studied in, in, in a different school from sixth grade all the way to 12th grade. Every year was a different school. So my ability to accept change was actually from the, from the environment. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting thinking back and, and seeing that I can have a, I have core competencies in persistency and ability to accept change, which they actually don't look alike. But they, general. but you still have them. Mm -hmm. And so when you move, or when you are probably the kind of person, then that can go. Okay, what are we going to do next? Instead of oh, I can't get out of this box, right? Although when you find something that you're going to be good at, you're going to make sure that it happens too, right? So they have both. They're neither good nor bad, but they can be a they can be a strength to you. Um, our, the one thing that as we talk about in the next screen, it says, now what do I do? Okay, so I have a high activity level, or so my kid doesn't like loud noises. Now what do I do with this? And so the one thing that we want to do is beware of labeling your child. 
So you need to be very careful as we go into this next section of labeling and making sure that it doesn't come off on of a negative. If you have a child that is very active, to not call him hyperactive or he's a handful, even though those are the words that we ask you to describe that person, that sometimes will have a, a really um, negative twist to it. So be very careful of doing that. One thing that we want to talk about is environment. What determines a child's temperament? And so up here I have some influences that will affect your child's temperament. As I talked about in the um, different temperament traits, because my daughter went around a lot, it influenced her. So let's look at some things that will influence a child's or a person's temperament. Um, parents, brothers and sisters, grandparents and other relatives, teachers and caregivers, toys and activities. How could toys be an influence on a child's temperament? How could that affect a child's temperament? Toys and activities. Yes? I guess it kind of depends on the toys that you give your child, anywhere from like the Tonka trucks, like playing in the sand, or maybe just give them computer games and video games. Okay, yeah. Okay, Saul, you had a comment. Well, very similar. I, I assume it's uh, if you have um, games like Lego, or you have games that are more artistic and painting, uh, it will not only help the child's development, but uh, it will strengthen that specific trait, and he will feel more comfortable. Okay. Now, have any of you, those are perfect answers. Have any of you met a family that they're big in hunting? I mean, they're hunters. And so all their children are <laughs> hunters, you know, or motorcycles, or maybe it's baseball. You know, so that trait is going to, what the parent loves, is going to influence the child. And I, uh, I just think it's funny when I hear kids later on as adults like, I hated that, but my parents made me do it. You know, I think, oh, really, did they make you? Um, but on the other hand, you know, sometimes those bonding experience will be a good influence for our child, just being with our children. Brothers and sisters, I think we've already talked about those. Television. How is television a influence on a child's life? Julianne, do you have any ways that television influenced your child's life or influenced bad, you? Bad or good? <laughs> it, 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 both. It tell us. Television can make a child passive. Okay. Uh, good, I guess, if there's music involved, it can kind of teach them the ways of the world. But sometimes that can be a bad thing because they can be t too educate, educated from it. Okay. Nancy. My children say that. As adults, they all love animals because when they were little, we watched a lot of the nature shows on TV. Yes, so it can have a negative or positive. One thing when we talk about um, television, if you have a child that is has a low activity level, and you know what? You better make sure that, that not all they're doing is watching television. I have a child like this. And I have to constantly remind her, why don't we go do this? Why don't we go do that? And because it will have, an, um, because of her personality, it, will, it has a very big influence on her. Yes, Saul. In regards to television, I, I personally believe that uh, television can be seen from two different aspects. It just can be seen as the end task, or a minds to an end, mm -hmm. or a, a ways to an end. And uh, as we take in the, in the later approach, we see television as a way to explore the world um, from from a screen, and then you can actually then go outside and implement the the thoughts, the ideas that you see on the television, instead of just having, uh, she was mentioning, just a passive. Okay. Um, and and we're going to discuss that in just a minute when we talk about the learning triangle, how it can be a plus for children. So it really is something that can have a good or a bad effect on children. And as you watch our workshop on media literacy, we talk about those good and the bad and how you can be, that television could be a tool, but let's not make it the teacher. Um, neighborhood, home and bedroom, child care and school and friends. Um, what's really interesting that research shows that during the child's first 12 to 13 years of life, 
that these things are the most important influence or they have the most influence on a child's life. And as a child gets older, then it flips down to where friends, school and child care or where they're hanging out, home and bedroom and neighborhood have just as much or more influence than these up here. And so as you work with your child, remember in those formative years, you really have an influence. And and then as they get older, but what is really, I think a really good thing to think of is that we get our temperament in the first probably 12 to 13 years. We've defined that. And so sometimes children might resist, but they come back to the core influences that have really had a good effect of their life. Now, um, we're going to go next to um, person to person, which most of the people in this group have actually been able to do. And we've been able to describe your temperament in one sentence and the person that you were looking at. And as we took a break, the people here in this the studio audience were able to do that. And um, at you that are viewing this from home or in a group, why don't you do that? Take a minute now to describe your temperament. When um, I was working, just speaking with Matt, we found that he has less active. He's very sensitive to other, aware of other people's feelings. And it didn't surprise him, but he's like, oh, yes, I am like this. And so try to describe that and then try to describe the person you were circling. Sometimes you will find out um, that, as William said, that we're very alike, more alike than we thought we were sometimes. Um, and then um, now what do we do with it? And this is where we're going to go to next is finding the right fit. As we talk about different temperament traits, I'm just going to give you some examples in each nine temperament traits, maybe what you can do. But one thing that we want to really concentrate is on the handout. There's 42 pages. And we use this guide with permission from um, KERA that they developed this to help us really understand and what you can do as parents. So there's some homework involved when you leave. So you're not here going, oh, I know them. Now what do I do? You need to make some conscious effort to find out. But we're just going to talk about some very specific ones very quickly. Um, as far as activity levels, how to help a child that's very active in discipline. Now, I'm going to take maybe three or four of the different traits and go back and forth with these. But let's think about timeout. Timeout is a pretty common um, factor to use for children to help discipline them. And so let's talk about a child that if we put them on timeout and they were the child that was moving all the time, what would be happening while they were in a timeout chair? Would they be thinking of what they were doing wrong? Brett, what do you think might be occurring with a child that's sitting on a chair that has a high activity level and they're supposed to be being disciplined? What would that child be doing? Digiting around. Digiting around? Um, when we put our daughter, who I think has a very high activity level, when I sit her on the couch, she's usually looking around, just moving around, sitting on the chair, the arm of the chair. Um, <laughs> Pulling off her clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Is she thinking about what she's done wrong? No. No. Okay. So that's a good thing to realize is that let's talk about that, that my children that have a high activity level, it was like, Mom, how many more minutes? You know? And so is it effective? Maybe giving that child dusting or maybe having that child vacuum or putting the dishes, um, sorting dishes would probably be a little bit better for them. Um, for a child that's less active, anyone have a child that's less active that you put them in timeout? Mary, has it been effective? Um, not really. He's quite content to count the dimples <laughs> in the wall. Um. So has he changed his behavior? <laughs> No, not okay. really. Okay, I'm just a general um, thing. Research now states that timeout really is not an effective way for children to change their behavior. Is it effective for parents sometimes to <gasps> take a breath and cool it? Yeah, but does it change the behavior? Not necessarily. Same, Mary, I have the same thing. I have a daughter that's very less active, and when I put her in timeout, she'd probably just go, wow. Do you think that guy is ever going to marry me? I mean, she's been having a, a wonderful daydream. Okay, let's go to the next uh, slide with sensitivity to senses. 
Um, let's talk about television a little bit more. As Saul and Julianne was describing, a child that is very sensitive to senses and they see the news and it's bad. Hey, Shelly, uh, you must have an experience with this. Tell us. The big blizzard of 2010 that was supposed to hit a week and a half ago, my daughter, that's all they talked about. And every time she heard that, is the roof going to fly off? Are we going to die? Are we going to... And I just wanted to strangle everybody in the media. Okay. So, you know, one thing with child that is very sensitive to senses, TV can really have an impact on them. Okay. And then let's go to the other one, a child that's less sensitive. Sometimes when they see so much violence, it really has no meaning to them. So we need to really temper that or really talk about those things. Let's move to the next slide. Now, I'm just giving you some examples because you need to do some homework because we're talking about different things. Um, aware of people's feelings. Let's talk about relationships with this. Um, for a child that is very aware of other people's feelings, what are some things that we might want to caution them to do or you know, to help them? Can you think of an example? Maybe I'm not wording that right. For a child that always wants to be hugging. Okay, Barbara? I think sometimes that you have to teach your children how to draw appropriate boundaries. Yes. And even, even at a very young age, they can learn that. Okay, all right. And then for a child that is very unaware of their feelings, how are you going to help them with their friendships? Mary? Sometimes you need to point out what the other child is feeling. Oh, well, you hit this child. <laughs> this child is now feeling pain. You, you are hurting this child. Yeah. You need to apologize. You need okay. to give them loves and let them know that you still care about them. Okay. And you need to point it out to them because they're just oblivious. <laughs> okay. I just want to really quickly, in this one, children under the age of three are what we call egocentric. The world revolves around them. That's the way they're made. Okay, so you're not going to get around that they don't think only of themselves because they normally do. Now, you might have a child that comes wired with a awareness of other people's feelings, so they are very aware from the very start. But for most general population, they're what we call egocentric. They only care about themselves. And if you ask a two-year-old to tell another two-year-old they're sorry, number one, they're not. And you really are making them actually say something that's very insincere. A better way to do that is to say, I'm really sorry that Tommy hit you, even though Tommy's sitting there going, I still want that toy. <laughs> you know. So you have to realize that up until the age of three or four, that children are not going to be sincere. Don't force them to apologize. You apologize maybe for them and help them feel that. Or when they, something's wrong, how do you feel? Let, like Mary said, give them the words and help them understand that. Okay, let's move to the next one. Strength of expression. Let's think about their environment. How with a child that has, um, that's very expressive, what kind of toys and activities maybe would you like with a child that's very expressive? Tom, I've sort of skipped over you for a couple minutes. What, what are some of the things for a child that's always you know, moving and you know exactly what they're feeling? What are some things that you, toys or activities you could provide with them? Uh, clearly art um, and uh, building toys. Uh, sports were always good for us. We have a child like this, and he explored lots of different things. He's very artistic, so that always helped. Okay. Wow. Isn't that interesting that we help them? Great parent, great parents that do that. Uh, how about a child? What kind of toys that, or um, activities that you could help with a child that you never know how they're feeling. Like I said about my son, we'll give you $100, just tell us how you're feeling. <laughs> what are some things that we could do to help them? Tom, you have a suggestion. Well, I, I think that same child had a lot of, that I was just talking about, had some problems expressing himself and through, through those activities was able to express himself. Okay. You know, through his art, uh, through some of the sports that he did, yeah. uh, was able to really express himself in a lot of ways that he couldn't do just verbally talking to you. Okay. Music is a good one. Yes. Isn't music a really good one for children to do that? 
um, to listen to th their type of music. And, and you know, one thing it suggests in the handout is to play a lot of games where they might have to describe their feelings or what is this person feeling. Um, we're going to um, go take a, a break right now, and I want you to, at home, I want you to continue with this. I want you to think about what are some great ways that you can discipline. This handout has very good suggestions. Remember, I want you to think about timeout, though. Timeout usually is more helpful for a parent. We usually like to try to call it a time in. Let's take a time in, go in your room, play with your toys, pound some clay with one of my sons, you know, go bounce a basketball, and then let's express how we're feeling. Those are probably better ways. Unless the parent needs a timeout, then you can take a timeout for yourself, but <laughs> call it more of a time in where children can maybe explore some things and then give them some alternative um, actions so that does not happen again. If we're not giving children things that they could do otherwise, then the behavior probably will not change. In a previous segment, we had some discussion about television. And because KBYU is producing this, we know that television is very important in a child's life. KBYU offers nine hours a day of children's programming. We would never want a child to watch nine hours a day. In fact, research shows that if a child watches over nine hours a week, that it has a negative effect on all areas of their learning um, development. And so we want television to be very successful. And at KBYU, we have what we call the learning triangle. In fact, in many of the other workshops, we practice it. We show you how to do this. But today, we're just going to just mention it. So as you work with your children with different temperaments, that it will help you. First of all, we want a child to watch a show. And as you watch a show, realize what theme they're talking about. Are they talking about colors? Are they talking about feelings? Are they talking about physical activity? After you've watched that show, then read a book that has the same theme, not the exact storyline, but just a similar theme. And then do an activity. Most of us know that when we do something, that's where the real learning takes place. And so as you look at your child's temperament, maybe you have a child that's not aware of other people's feelings, then maybe you should watch a show like Clifford that really focus on feelings. And as you watch that show, make sure you describe those feelings. Then maybe get a book that's called How Are You Peeling? Foods with Moods, where it describes different feelings. And then maybe as you're walking down the street or as you're looking at a book, just point out, what do you think that person's feelings? Can you see how that would help a child that's maybe a little bit unaware of other people's feelings? This is how we feel like television can be very beneficial in a child's life. And one thing that we want to do is as you look at temperament, make sure that you find the right fit. We've covered a lot of information in a very short amount of time. And so your guide is going to be something that you need to refer to over and over again. It's a study guide for you. We've just sort of skimmed the surface of this. And so who is your child? Embrace that because your child is very special and we don't want them to change.